Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Arise with me, Sally Goodwin. It is so good to see you all this morning. I think I am two minutes late. Sincere apologies for that. But um, <laughs> I'm still getting used to setting myself up with my laptop and using this for Facebook Live instead of my cell phone. So that is still... And if I fiddle with my stuff, <laughs> so the camera on the laptop is the other way around. So like I'm seeing myself, you know, if I touch this shoulder, it's mirrored <laughs> or something. Anyway, <sighs> that is nothing. <laughs> it's just, I'm just getting used to all of these things. I'm getting used to all of these things. So Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Arise with me, Sally Goodwin, on this beautiful Wednesday morning. It is Wednesday, the 18th of January, 2023. And I know that there are, I think in Cape Town anyway, schools go back today. So I know that a lot of you are probably getting your kiddies off to school. Good morning, Bridget. Lovely to see you, my beautiful friend. Um, you're, you're probably getting your kiddies off to school, you're probably doing all sorts of things and so um, I get that there will be a lot of you who won't be able to be on the live this morning because of that and I completely understand that. My days, good morning Jen, my beautiful Jen friend, lovely to see you and um, yes so we are going live from from my, my laptop as opposed to my um, cell phone because of my sound issues because i went and spilled coffee all over myself i'm just checking out the light scenario it is lovely this morning because it is um a beautiful overcast morning although apparently we are going to have a heat wave so i'm not quite sure how that's going to work okay sorry i'm still trying things out um are you going to school bridget okay <laughs> I understand that completely my days of taking kiddies to school are long gone and I tell you something that I actually miss it um, you never think you're going to miss it when you're in the thick of it but later on you really you miss those days you know I have also tried to move a little bit away from the camera so when I glanced briefly at my previous video just to see whether it all worked out fine I was like, oh my word, all you see is my face. I'm just like writing, you know. So obviously just in terms of the camera and everything, so I'm just sitting a little bit further away. So I might just need to speak up a little bit, but just so that it's not just my face that you're getting like, you know, so, so fully, fully, fully in there. So yes good morning good morning good morning good morning everybody it is so good to see you on this beautiful morning good morning renee my gorgeous friend lovely to see you and um and you are just really it is it is a good morning it is a really good morning good morning debbie my delightful debbie lovely to see you my friend um it is it is a good morning but can i just be honest with you and this is where i'm going this morning so i know we've been doing the ezra nehemiah thing and we may go back to that um but there are a few things that god has laid on my heart to bring and so i sometimes god lays things on my heart and then i have a kind of a plan with where i'm going and then the holy spirit comes in and does something different and i i follow him <laughs> I follow the Holy Spirit. Good morning, LCB. Lovely to see you, my friend. I hope you're moving. Everything is all done and sorted and you settled in your new space. Uh, so yeah, so I, I, I err on the side of following Holy Spirit, if it is possible to err on that side. Good morning, Samantha. Sam Good morning, not Samantha. Simon from Grayton. Grayton's in the house, people. Good morning, Simon. I should wear my glasses so that I can see the messages properly. But you know when you wear glasses and then there's like a reflection, you know, that sort of puts me off a little bit. But anyway, good morning, Simon. Lovely to have you here from Grayton. I bet you've been sweltering in this heat over the last couple of days. 
for my international um, viewers, it has been so hot here recently. Beautiful Bertha, lovely to see you, my friend. My, seeing my beautiful Bertha friend always reminds me to ask you to like and share, <laughs> to like and share my post. And um, particularly this morning's post to, to your South African friends or your African friends, because I have been struggling the last little while. I think, and this could be just me, um, and maybe this doesn't affect any of you ladies or gentlemen, but I think that load shedding, um, so just for those of you, for my international friends who often reach out to me and say, what on earth is load shedding? And my beautiful friend, Renee, uh, who from West Virginia, who thought I was saying load sharing, <laughs> because sometimes the, sometimes my, the accent gets her, you know? So we are indeed load sharing the load shedding. <laughs> Um, but for those of you, I don't know, but load shedding, I think that it gets to one. Um, even though there are many positives to it and we're so resilient as a nation and just Africans in general, we're so resilient, you know, and we come up with solutions and we make the best of things and we're really good at that. But I think it affects us from a from a hope perspective, um, from a, you know, it, it's, there's an anxiety attached to load shedding, there's an anxiety attached to what is happening with ESCOM, who again, for my international friends, is our, is our state or nation electricity provider. You know, there is an anxiety attached to that, and there is an anxiety that is attached to ESCOM and load shedding that then feeds into our overall anxiety about our nation and our government and what's happening with our nation. And, you know, I think that we have concerns and anxieties around our nation, which are completely normal and understandable. And then load shedding and the whole issues with it, the whole issue with ESCOM adds to that. And maybe if this is just me, but for the last little while, I've struggled with hope. I've really struggled. I've been saying to the Lord, you know, I have three adult children. Um, and I've just been saying to the Lord, I need some hope, Lord. I need some hope to to take me, to, to, to some hope for my nation, some hope for my continent. Good grief. Some hope for the whole entire world, you know, hope for the globe. And I know that our hope is in Jesus. I know that Jesus is our only hope. I get all of that. I understand that. But just as normal, ordinary human beings, there are just days when you just like, you know, Jesus, I know you are our only hope, but I need something a little bit more tangible than that. And, um, and if maybe it's only me, maybe I'm the only person who feels like that, you know, uh, possibly I am just, um, but I just have found my, my own kind of mental health and my own natural optimism has just been really kind of taking a beating over the last little while over the, these last intense stages of load shedding and god dropped this verse into my mind and i'm going to read you this verse from four different translations okay and then i'm going to explain because this verse when i read it to you you're going to be like sally that has nothing to do with hope but I want, I want to read this to you. Okay. It is Proverbs 23, 23. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 23. In the King James, the New King James Version, it says, Buy the truth and do not sell it. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. That is in the New King James Version. Okay, in the Amplified Version. In the Amplified Version of Proverbs 23, 23. Buy the truth and sell it not. Not only that, but also get discernment and judgment, instruction and understanding. Okay, that is the Amplified Version. The Passion Translation. The Passion Translation, ladies. Proverbs 23, 23. Embrace the truth and hold it close. Don't let go of wisdom, instruction, and life-giving understanding.
Proverbs 22, 3, 23 in the Passion Translation. And last but never least, in the Message Translation, buy truth, don't sell it for love or money, buy wisdom, buy education, buy insight. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this verse, the Holy Spirit dropped into my spirit. And I went and I read it and I was like, Jesus, thank you for this verse. Good morning, Volna. Lovely to see you, my friend. Thank you for this verse, but I do not understand how this can give me hope. <laughs> and then I started just processing this verse with Jesus. Buy truth. Don't sell it for love or money. Buy wisdom. Buy education. Buy insight. And I, you know, when you buy something, when you pay for something, when you, when you take your hard-earned money and you pay for something, you know, um, there's a saying that goes something along the lines of people only value what they pay for. In other words, when you give something away for nothing, then often people don't value it as much because they value what they pay for. If it costs them something, you know, they have some skin in the game, you know, they have, they've, they've had to sacrifice something to receive something. There's a value that people attach to that that is more than if they just get it for nothing. And so when, when they say, when Solomon um, says in Proverbs, by truth, what he's saying is this, he is saying that um, the, it's, it's something that is worth paying for. It is something that is worth actually sacrificing for. It is something that is worth the cost. To have the truth, it is worth the cost. And we know over the history of our um, of Christianity, over the history of our nation and the nations of the world, the truth has cost people dearly. People have paid with their lives for the truth, you know, to bring the truth out, to, to speak the truth, to let the truth be heard. People have paid with their lives for that. And so the truth costs, and it costs us dearly in some instances. And so God really, he dropped this into my spirit and I was like, okay, Jesus, like I'm buying the truth. Now for those of you who know, and, and so, and we've been speaking about discernment, have we not over the last, I don't know how many arises, I have been speaking about ask God for discernment, hone your gift of discernment, you know, get more discernment, whatever you can do, discernment, discernment, discernment is what we need in this time that we are in as a nation, as a church, as a body of Christ, we need discernment. Discernment is so incredibly important. And so I've been really, and so some of those, one of those translations, I forget now which one it was, speaks about discernment. So we're speaking about truth. We're speaking about wisdom. We're speaking about education. We're speaking about insight. We're speaking about discernment. We're speaking about understanding. Those are the various things that are referenced in these various translations. Which is why I always encourage people to just read like loads of translations because you just get the fullness of what God intended for us to get within the scriptures. If you stick to one translation, you get a very one-sided viewpoint of what something looks like. Good morning, Nadia. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you, my friend. Okay, so we are speaking about Proverbs 20, 23 and buying the truth. Now, for those of you who know, I am studying. So I am doing a degree in theology. And when God first started speaking to me, I'm, I'm in second year, ladies, woohoo, second year. <laughs> At 53, I'm in my second year of studying theology, come on. <laughs> but, um, you know, when God started speaking to me about studying, I was kind of like, okay, Lord, but really, you know, I'm 53, <laughs> you know, and I've always wanted to get a degree, I've always wanted to study, I love studying the Bible, that is like, it's, I could just literally be like a hermit in a cave, me and Jesus and the Word. Like, I'm, that's what I'm like. I'm a natural scholar. I love to study. I love to learn. I love all of those things. And he was like, you need to know. You, like, you need to. And, you know, also, as we all know, um, there are streams of theology that you can study that are not helpful and not necessarily healthy. And so it was quite a, a walk with the Lord just to reach a point where I was like, okay, this is the stream of theology, you know, that I need to study. This is the space. And for those of you who are interested, I'm studying, sorry, I'm still just getting used to my space here. And I'm just kind of moving things around a little bit to just see what works better for me. Not very professional, I know, but come on, this is just me, guys. This is just me. Anyway, so 
Here I am, so I'm studying through the South African Theological Seminary, an incredible organization uh, that caters to across the board, all denominations, all, you know, and so they do not enforce a specific theology, I mean, apart from obviously believing in Jesus, you know, and the Father and the Holy Spirit and, you know, the basics of, of our faith. But apart from that, the, the places and spaces where we disagree theologically, you know, across the body of Christ, they don't enforce anything. They kind of are, these are the different, you know, things that are, that are out there, like sit with Jesus, sit with the Holy Spirit. You know, what is it that you feel he's saying to you, which I love. So they're not, they're not, they don't like, you know, brainwash you into believing a specific thing, which is amazing. So I'm studying through them. And so this, and, um, and it's been incredible. It's been an incredible journey. I've loved every moment. Of it. So I really, when I read Proverbs 23, 23, I was like, Jesus, I am doing this. I am buying truth. I am buying wisdom. I am buying education. I am buying insight. You know, I am doing this. I am, I am, um, paying to be, to learn things so that, so that I have a, a space where I can be knowledgeable because discernment and knowledge and truth, knowing the truth, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be so incredibly important going forward. Knowing the truth. You know, it says in the word that the truth sets you free. If you do not know the truth, how do you get set free? And so I'm having this conversation with the Lord. And anyway, this last module that I've been studying so it works in terms and you do modules and all of this kind of thing and this last module I've been studying which I may have referenced before is um, church history if the module is called a survey of church history and it's basically church history right from acts right through to sort of the very early 2000s it's church history 2000 years of church history now let me tell you something that studying 2000 years of church history does well for me anyway it does not fill you with joy it does not it actually makes you look at the history of the church and say to the lord why are you still bothered about it like why are you still so invested in your church because look at what we have done over 2000 years ladies the study of church history is daunting and it is incredibly it can be in many spaces and places incredibly depressing and and i've literally i've written a whole lot of assignments and essays and exams and things like that and i found myself in places where i was just like i'm so depressed by this i'm so depressed by church history i, I like I, you know, I'm, I'm just like, you know, come Jesus, come. Let us just get to the end of this because we have just, we're just not doing very well as the body of Christ. So you have to read these incredibly large and very weighty kind of textbooks on church history. And there are many people who have written on church history. But then I got to the last, so I'm almost finished the module. I have one big exam on Monday. Pray for me, ladies. Pray for me. Big exam on Monday. But so I'm reading the last of the last of the last textbook. And this is an incredible man. His name is Joseph Early Jr. Joseph Early Jr. Let me just get his credentials for you because we need credentials. So we know where we are coming from when we speak about these people who write these things. He wrote this book called um, A History of Christianity, an Introductory Survey. Okay. He is, it was written, it was published in 2015, and it is, his name is Joseph Early Jr., and he is a professor of church history, theology, philosophy, and ethics at Campbell, Campbellsville University in Kentucky. Okay, he is an American professor. He has a Master of Divinity degree and a Doctor of Philosophy degree in Church History. Why am I giving you his credentials? I'm giving you his credentials so that it's not someone who just decided to sit down and write about Church History and wrote about it from their own perspective and their own, you know. This is a man who is credentialed. He has a doctorate, he, you know, in Church History. He has all of these things and he has written this introductory survey to Church History. And why he calls it an introductory survey is because it's one volume. So most um, books or you know 
because church because it's 2000 years of church history it's very difficult to condense it into one book into one volume so he has written one volume of church history okay so obviously there are things he's had to leave out and all of that kind of thing and he, and he says all of that in the beginning but it's an incredible it's an incredible feat that he's actually managed to write this so I'm getting there, ladies. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I know some of you are wondering, what on earth, where is she going with all of this? Anyway, so in the very final chapter, so obviously we've covered everything from the early church right through the Crusades, you know, the Roman Catholic Church, the split into the Reformation and the split into Protestantism, all the splits if we're through Protestant churches, you know, how we got to Baptists and Presbyterians and the Pentecostals and the Charismatics and the um, evangelicals and the first great awakening and the second great awakening and you know that we all trust him for the third great awakening which will be the final great awakening which will sweep through the world um, and God's glory will be seen across the earth as the same as the waters cover the sea and it will usher us into the new millennium so now here we go so he's we've covered all of this and I've read his whole entire book up until this very last chapter and I'm just like okay he gives a very very uh, balanced view of church history you know the good the bad and the downright ugly it's all in there and it can be quite depressing and with, with that and everything that's happened in my nation I'm just like oh my word and here we go so now we have where the hope comes in and I want to read you ladies please don't be bored by this okay this is important that I'm bringing this to you this morning this is important and um, listen to what I'm saying this is where the hope comes in um, and there's a little, a few things that I want to read to you. So, so I want to, I want you to listen to this. Okay, his final chapter is obviously the early two thousands, and so, and he he has a section entitled the Global South. Now, for those of you who aren't good at geography, we are part of the Global South. So the Global South is the southern portion of the world. You know, the northern portion over here and the southern portion over here. He says. There are 503 million Christians in Latin America, also part of the Global South. There are 503 million Christians in Africa. There are 368 million Christians in Asia. In the last quarter of the 20th century, these numbers grew by more than a quarter of a billion. In the global south, ladies, we're only talking about the global south now. We're not talking about the Western church. We're not talking about the European. We're talking about the global south, okay? By 2011, Christians comprised 24% of the population of the continents of the global south. The majority, listen to this, the majority of the world's Christians, therefore, now live in the global south. The majority of the world's Christians now live in the global south. Unfortunately, um, for my beautiful friend Michelle, who's from Australia, Australia is the ex or who lives in Australia, Australia is the exception to Christianity's vibrancy in the southern hemisphere. Similar to the situation in Europe, nearly 70% of Australians openly identify with Christianity, but only 10% attend worship services. Listen to this. Whether Catholic, Evangelical, or Pentecostal, the overwhelming majority of Christians in the Global South are conservative in theology, believe in supernatural manifestations such as divine healing, and regard the Bible as true in all that it says. Africa has 40 times more Christians in 2000 than they were in 1900. 40 times more Christians in Africa in the year 2000 than they were in the year 1900. In the year 2000, an average of 2,300 people a day converted to Christianity. In the year 2000, 2,300 people a day in Africa converted to Christianity. Because of Islam's dominance in North Africa since the 7th century, Christianity's growth has been almost exclusively relegated to the Sub-Saharan region. That's us, ladies, the Sub-Saharan region. As of 2011, nearly 75% of the South African population self-identified as Christian. Now, can I stop you there? 
let, let's, because immediately I can hear this, the things, yes, but how many of them are genuine believers in Jesus? How many of them are laid down, lovers of God, surrendered, etc.? That's not the point right now. The point is that 75% of the South African population in 2011 self-identified as Christian. Yes, it might be because they don't identify as Jewish or Hindu or Muslim, you know, so they immediately assume they're Christian. That might be the case, but that's not the point. The point is that Christianity ladies, the more Christians in the whole world are now situated in the global south in Africa. South Africa has thousands of independent churches, most of which are associated with Pentecostalism. Pentecostalism is the largest Christian movement in Africa. Um, let me just go because I made lots of notes, but I'm not going to bore you with any with all of them. I am just going to give you the, I wanted to read all of it, but I don't think that I'll maintain your attention for all of that. So, so this is what I'm saying, ladies. Do you understand that, you do, that this is hope? When I was reading this, I felt the hope come back into my soul because if this is what's going on, we, you know what the thing is. Okay, so this is, Maybe this is just me, okay? I'm putting my hand up for this. Why do I not know the history of the African church? Why do I not know about things, revivals that have happened in Africa? Why do I know about the Azusa Street revival? And I know about the Brownsville revival. And I know about the Toronto Blessing, for example. But I do not know about the revival that happened along the Ivory Coast in 1913 and 1914, where 100,000 people came to know Jesus. How come I do not know that a man called Simon Kim Kimbanyu started a mass movement in the Congo in 1921? He was arrested and spent the rest of his life in prison. Ladies, because in 1921, the Congo was still colonized by Belgium. And when Simon Kim Kimbanyu, um, my apologies to anyone who knows that I'm pronouncing that name incorrectly, when he started this mass movement in the Congo, this movement for Jesus, the Belgium authorities thought he was leading an insurrection against them and they arrested him. He spent the rest of his life in prison. He, his followers were persecuted and they fled to safe havens in Central Africa. By 2011, his followers became known as the Church of Jesus Christ on Earth. Ladies, they are estimated to have five and a half million members in Africa, Europe and North America. Five and a half million members in Africa, Europe and North America. This man in the Congo in 1921 started a mass movement. How come we don't know about that? Okay, just for me, how come I don't know about that? How, how come I am so not knowledgeable about the history of my African church that I don't know about the revivals that have taken place on African soil? How come the only revival that I have a vague inkling about is the one that took place in Wellington with Andrew Murray? Why is that? Why are we not taught this stuff? You know, and let before we all start talking about um, ancestor worship and syncretism, which does take place within the, not only in Africa, ladies, in other places in the world, um, there is syncretistic religion where, you know, they sort of join Christianity with whatever they used to believe, which we know is wrong. But the Church of Jesus Christ on Earth, with its estimated five and a half million members, forbids tribal syncretism, tribal dances, polygamy, ancestor worship, and witchcraft and violence. So they forbid all of those things, okay? They are purely focused on Jesus. These are revivals where they saw people raised from the dead. They saw miraculous healings. They saw people come to know Jesus. They saw all of the things that were seen in revivals that took place in North America. They saw all of these things. This particular revival that started in the Congo in 1921 spread up ladies into Europe, spread up into North America. This has led to a church that consists of five and a half million members. This is in Africa, ladies and gentlemen. This comes out of Africa. He ends, this is how, this is how Joseph Early Jr. ends this section. He says this, Perhaps more than any other place in the world, and bear in mind, he is an American man, okay? 
perhaps more than any other place in the world, indigenous African churches are having great success and bearing much fruit. If the increase in African Christians continues at its current rate, Africa will be home to the world's largest Christian population by 2025. This book was published in 2015, 10 years ago. We are in 2023. By if the increase in African Christians continues at its current rate, Africa will be home to the world's largest Christian population by 2025. The majority of these Christians will be affiliated with a uniquely indigenous and independent version of Pentecostalism. Africa, by 2025, will have the largest Christian population the largest Christian population, Africa, 2025. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, but if that does not give you hope for our nation, if that does not give you hope for our continent, if that does not fill you with expectation and excitement, if that does not explain the attack, the fervent, unceasing, relentless attack of the enemy on our nation and our continent, if that does not bring you to your knees interceding for our nation, interceding for our continent, decreeing and declaring that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven, then I actually just do not know what does. Here, Joseph Early says, in the 19th century, the stereotype of a Christian was a Caucasian male from the global north. In the 19th century, the stereotype of a Christian was a Caucasian male from the global north. In the 21st century, the average Christian is a darker skinned female from the global south. High five ladies, can we just high five right now? In the 21st century, the stereotype of an average Christian has changed from a Caucasian male to a darker skinned female from the global south. That is the stereotype of an average Christian. My heart can't stand it. My, I am overwhelmed by the goodness of God. I am overwhelmed that God is moving so powerfully in a nation and a continent that so many people think has been forgotten by God. In a nation and a continent that the very people, the very believers who live in, think has been forgotten by God. He has not forgotten, ladies. We just don't know what's going on out there. We are just so focused on, and I'm speaking for myself and possibly the particular stream of church that I come out of, because I don't know what it's like for the churches that you ladies go to. But I am not taught on African church history. I am not taught on, on revivals and incredible movements that have happened. I'm just this I'm just putting this out there ladies but you know this revival that we constantly pray for as churches the one that starts from the southernmost tip and goes up into the north what if that's already happened what if we are praying for something that has already taken place and we don't know because we don't know our history because we are so arrogant that if it hasn't happened in our generation we don't see it as being valid because it could have happened years ago, because it could have happened in a different African nation, because it could have happened with a different person, we are so arrogant that we don't see that as having been the revival that God was speaking about. What if that revival has happened? What if Africa has been on a slow burn, not just a slow burn, a big burn, for years, for a century, and we have just not been educated enough and knowledgeable enough and had enough discernment and understanding to know it and to recognize it. And so we are constantly waiting for something that God has already done, and God is saying to us, will you catch up, please? I have moved. I am moving. You carry revival. It is happening. Africa is moving. She is doing things. She is going. She is sending missionaries. All of those things. The amount of people that when I prophesy that, 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 that Africa is a Joseph to the nations and the amount of people who say, how, how, how is that possible? You know, how is that possible? That Africa can be the Joseph to the nations. Well, it is very possible. 
practically and spiritually. Spiritually, just by virtue of the facts that I have just read to you. These are facts, ladies and gentlemen. These are facts that can be borne out and can be researched and found to be true. So, and practically, just by virtue of the land mass that we occupy, the space that we have for crops, the, the minerals that inhabit our earth, we can absolutely be a Joseph to the nation. We can absolutely have the keys to the storehouse. And why do you think that the strongholds of religion and the strongholds of, of political um, the political spirit and the strongholds of corruption are so intent on maintaining their grip on the, pro on the continent of Africa and the nation of South Africa and the Congo and Nigeria and Kenya and, all, and Zimbabwe and all of those places. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that, that the enemy is so intent on keeping us racially divided because he knows that if we stand together in unity as one people under Jesus, we will be, there will be no stopping us. We will be unstoppable. This, in 1931, a gentleman called John Mbiti, again, apologies to those of you who know that I'm pronouncing these names incorrectly. Please forgive me. A gentleman called John Mbiti, a Christian philosopher in Uganda, come on Jesus for Uganda, said, the centers of the church's universality are no longer in Geneva, Rome, Athens, Paris, London, and New York, but in Kinshasa, Buenos Aires, Addis Ababa, and Manila. And then Joseph Early ends by saying this, and this, my heart, he says, perhaps the reason for this global shift is that God goes where he is most wanted. Perhaps the reason for this global shift is that God goes where he is most wanted. Can you believe it? Do we need the Lord in Africa? We absolutely do. We need God in Africa so freaking badly. Does South America need Jesus? Absolutely. Does God go where people are desperate for him, where people need him, where people have, they, they have nothing else to do but to fall onto their knees and cry out for the presence of the Lord because they don't know where else to turn? Absolutely. Is that where God goes? Absolutely. The presence, perhaps the reason for this global shift is that God goes where he is most wanted. Ladies and gentlemen, for years now, I have been prophesying and calling out the African church, saying that the African church needs to rise up. The African church needs to step in to everything that God has called her to be. And you know, there are loads of African churches who are doing exactly that. Who are doing exactly that. They are not influenced by the Western churches. They are not influenced by any other. They are doing what comes what comes naturally to them as Africans rooted in the DNA of Africa with the, with the blood of the land running through them. Understand something also, ladies and gentlemen, this is not Christian nationalism that I'm preaching. I am not preaching Christian nationalism, okay? No, we do not, there is not a nationalistic spirit attached to this message. I am not preaching one nation over another or that one nation is more, you know, apart from Israel, who are the apple of God's eye. I am not preaching that any other nation is, you know, this be all and end all for Jesus. This is not Christian nationalism. This is a continent that has a destiny in God. This is a continent that has a purpose and a plan in the overall plan of God for the globe. This is a continent that has been maligned, that has been oppressed, that has been colonized, that has been persecuted for centuries that God is going to use to step up and step in to everything that he has for her so that she can be all that he has called her to be. This is that that I'm preaching. And this, that, ladies, that depends on you and on me. That depends on you and on me because we are called to co-labor. 
We are called to co-labor with God, to, to help out, to, to intercede, to pray. And maybe practically, maybe practically you and I are called to step into spheres of influence where we get to prophesy and, and advance the, our nation, South Africa, but not just our nation, South Africa. It's not separate from Africa, ladies. We might be right at the end, but we are not separate. We are part of the African continent. We are African. We may like to associate ourselves with the West. We may like to pretend that we are a first world country, but we are African. African and we need to step into what that looks like and as again maybe you are one of those who knows the entire history of the African nation maybe you are one of those who knows who knows all the revivals that have happened in Africa and what God has done in Africa I I was I was ignorant to that and I repented for that ignorance. I repented for that ignorance. I repented for the fact that I know more about the history of the America, the North American church than I know about the history of my, my church, my African body of Christ, my African, the African bride, that I know more about the North American bride than I know about the, about the African bride. I repented for that because I, I have not sought that knowledge. I haven't thought that that knowledge was worth, was worth having. Because I somehow bought into the lie that the answers would come from the West. The answers will not come from the West, ladies. The answers are going to come from, our, from Africa. The answers are going to come from our own space. The answers are going to come from you and from me. We need to step into what God has called us to do. We need to be what God has called us to do so that we can co-labor with him to ensure that our nation and our continent becomes all that God has called her to be instead of what the enemy's plans for her are. We need to have hope in order to intercede, in order to, to, be, to be desperate for Jesus to step in. We need to have hope that that is what he intends to do. And I'm just being honest. I'm being authentic. I'm being vulnerable. I've spent the last couple of weeks just feeling hopeless, hopeless for my nation, hopeless for my children's future within this nation. I'm just being honest. That's where I've been. And when God, you know, God didn't come and he didn't pat me on the head and he didn't say, it's okay, my darling, you know what, I'm going to give you hope because he was like, no, Sally, you know what you need to do? Buy truth, my girl. Buy truth. Go and purchase truth. Buy truth. Get discernment. Get understanding. Get education. Get insight. He was like, pick yourself up, girl. Put on your big girl panties and go and get the information that will make you feel hopeful again. Be responsible for your own hope. It's easy to be hopeless, ladies. It is easy to be hopeless. It is easy to throw our hands up in the air and go, there's no hope here. No one can fix ESCOM. No one can stop load shedding. We're exporting coal and we're not using the coal here. And, you know, every day we can read our news every day and find a reason to give up hope. Every single day without fail, someone in our government or someone somewhere will do something or say something which will give us valid reason to throw our hands in the air and say, there is no hope. There is no hope. I give up. I'm going to occupy my tiny piece of earth, protect it as much as I can, and just like wait for Jesus to come back. Or I'm going to look and see, you know, where the greener pastures are and, and possibly there's more. You know, I'm going to encourage my children to go overseas because there's more of a future there for them than there is here. You know, none of those, those standpoints are invalid. They're not invalid, but they don't bring hope. They don't bring hope for us. They don't bring hope for our children. But if we go and we educate ourselves and we get insight and understanding and knowledge on what God has done in Africa before we were here, we have hope for a future that can be a godly future. And we can see a light. And that light doesn't come from any government. It doesn't come from any political party. It doesn't come from any law that is passed. It doesn't come from any um, governmental authority that is put in power. It doesn't come from, it, it comes only from God. 
that light, that hope comes from God. Because at the end of the day, if we are prepared to co-labor with Jesus in the space that he has... Ladies, we were born for such a time as this. Before God laid the foundations of the earth, he was like, this person, Jennifer Hardesty, Bertha Hoffman, Rene Ibe, um, who else did I see on here? Simone from Grayton, Isana, um, Bridget from Harry Smith. Those, before the foundations of the earth, God was like, this person will be in Simone, for example. I'm using her as an example. In 2023, Simone will be in Grayton, in the Western Cape, in South Africa, on the continent of Africa, because she will be born for such a time as this. And that is applicable to all of us. No matter who you are, no matter where you live, no matter what part of this nation you occupy or what part of this continent you occupy. My friend Evelyn from Kenya, before God laid the foundations of the earth, he knew that Evelyn would be living in Kenya in 2023. And because she has a job to do there. She has a space to occupy. She has something to, to bring for the kingdom. And each one of you do. Each one of you do. Wherever you live, whatever you're doing, whatever area you occupy, you have, a, you have something to bring. God put you there. You're not there by coincidence. You're not there just because you were born there. You're not there just because um, your husband got transferred or you got transferred or your children had to go to a specific school and so you moved there. No, God put you there. He puts you there for a reason, for a season, to bring what he has caused you to bring, called you to bring, before the foundations of the earth were even laid. Ladies, I get that this, this teaching was more of a history lesson than anything else. And I trust that you, that you understand the, 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 the urgency and the importance that I feel is on this message. Because, because, because there are many of us who, who know more about what is happening in the churches, particularly in North America. Let's just use North America as an example. We know more of what is happening in the churches in North, of, in North America. We sometimes know more about the politics in North America than we know about our own nation. Why? Because we don't feel like it's worthwhile being involved here. What is the point? There is a point. There is a point because Africa has a destiny and a purpose. And the body of Christ in Africa, the bride of Christ in Africa, has a destiny and a purpose. And you and I are all part of that destiny and that purpose. And we each have to bring our part. We have to play our part. We have to bring our role. Ladies and gentlemen, God loves Africa. He has not forgotten us. He has not forgotten us. But he is waiting for his sons and daughters to step up and step in and co-labor to bring his promises and his prophetic words over South Africa and Africa to be. And let us ask the Lord if we are trusting for something that has already happened. Because you know what? What we need, and I've said this for years, revival is amazing, but we all carry revival inside of us. What we need is reformation. We need reformation because we need something that effects lasting change. Reformation effects lasting change. That's what we need here. That's what we need in our, in our nation. That's what we need on our continent. So absolutely, carry revival. Do the whole, you know, but let's, let's, let's not be arrogant enough to assume that nothing has ever happened in that way previously here. And let us, let us be praying and decreeing and declaring for reformation and lasting change and let us use the revival that we carry to bring that about the spirit that we carry to bring that about so ladies i just bless you with that i bless you with that i hope you were blessed i hope you weren't bored <laughs> out of your socks i hope you aren't wondering where i'm going you know like what's gone on but i just felt such an urgency to just bring hope hope for the future for not just for our nation but for our continent and just to remind you how much God loves you and how much God loves Africa and how you have a significant part to play. No matter what you do and where you are, you have a significant part to play. Okay, I love you.
each and every one of you. I am so blessed that you joined me this morning. I am so blessed to have you as part of this journey with me. I am so blessed to have you ladies who occupy the same um, geographical space as me. I'm so blessed to have you here. I'm so blessed to have ladies and gentlemen who are willing to step into this and, and call down from heaven that God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let us bring heaven to earth in South Africa and in the continent of Africa from this moment on. Love you, each and every one of you, and I shall see you on Friday morning at 7 o'clock. And we might return to Ezra and Nehemiah, and who knows, but who knows what the Holy Spirit has got for them. Love you all. Sorry I went a little bit longer, a little bit over time this morning. I hope the picture was fine. I hope the sound was fine. I hope everything was fine. Love you all, and see you all on Friday. Majen, love you. Please watch. Love you all. Bye. Bless you.